uh, you see I'm already the embodied confusion here, <laughs> bringing everything together in one person. It's better here? Okay. Uh, so at home I will uh, get you confused totally about what Baltic history uh, is about and what I'm doing uh, here. But first of all, thank you very much again, Christoph. Thank you, Helmut, for uh, all the support you gave me in the last four years uh, with the center and with everything we've been doing there. Um, if uh, without you, we would not exist anymore, I guess. So thank you, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you that I have the possibility to be here and to calm down a bit. Um, so, but uh, now to my talk today. Um, I promise to uh, confuse you, so first I will, uh, I have to confess that I will not read a paper, I uh, will have the talk in the way I love the most, I will speak just free, and it's the Estonian way how to make presentations, so uh, here, <laughs> here you have something good Estonian. Uh, and what I want to do, I will jump with you uh, throughout uh, three centuries. Um, we we'll start in the end of the 17th century, then we go on to the end of the 18th century, and uh, we finish, start, finish at the uh, end of the 19th century. And um, I will just share with you uh, some of the main uh, discourses in those three, three centuries. We start with uh, uh, gardening as a main issue uh, in early enlightenment and enlightenment. We go on with the counter discourse that is uh, about wild food but it's also quite connected with the gardening issue, as I will show you, I hope that at least. Uh, and we will end with the question of uh, how to graft a nation in the 19th century. Uh, and then, quite at the end of the, uh, the presentation, I will uh, show you three possibilities how to connect those uh, three centuries we have and the different uh, questions those, uh, that are posed. So, but let's start with uh, gardening in early enlightenment. Um, this is a poem written by a, an anonymous uh, author in 1696. Um, and this poem actually brought me to the topic of uh, food culture and gardening culture in the Baltics at all. It is a uh, poem that is not written in the bucolic style, you know, a uh, romantic, romantic way of how to grow flowers and everything is nice around. No, absolutely not. It's a uh, technical instructions uh, how to prepare the soil, how to plant the trees, how to cut them, how to graft them, how to do everything. It's just technical instruction, but in a poem form, in a form of poetry. Um, what is the most troubling about this poem? It, that it is written or published at least in the time when we had the most severe famine at all we had in the Baltics and we were quite at the eve of a very serious breakdown of uh, the whole society, the big break that started with the big famine in uh, 1696, continued with the Great Northern War in 1700 and ended with the plague. So um, <laughs> if all these three things began uh, over Estonia and, 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 and Livonia, uh, we had a population that was quite close to those uh, when the Baltic German invaders came in the medieval times, there were about 100,000 people left. So it was just a total breakdown of everything we had. So why we have a poem like this with technical instructions in a, a context that is really, really simple? So but first, who is the author of this uh, uh, poem? We know it quite well. It is, um, as you said, Carboris um, Fruit Garden. It's an acronym, and the author is Georg Holig, uh, or Holig Yushi, um, who is the author of the first really good series of gardening books of the Baltics. As you can see, uh, from beginning from 1684 onwards to 1739, uh, he wrote or published a couple of books. And those books are, were really, really important not only for Baltics, but uh, he was uh, very successful also in Germany and in uh, other countries. I will um, explain in the, a while why. But first, um, Holik himself was not born in the Baltic. 
uh, he was an excellent priest, uh, meaning uh, he was actually a Protestant, a Protestant person, then he had to become a Catholic, then he uh, flew from Bohemia, became a, a Protestant again, uh, then he chose to uh, become a gardener, and he uh, lived for a couple of years in Germany and in Sweden, and then he had each came to the waters. So, and here is where he uh, started to write his garden books. All these books he wrote are full of his early enlightenment and optimism that actually man has the power to do something good. So it was not the Baroque style of uh, Vanitas Vanitatum, no, it was this new optimism uh, in, in all these books we have there. In th the context I already told a bit about uh, was um, actually a very, very hard one. Um, the, the Baltic provinces, I'm sure you show me a card where they are, I guess you didn't know it, um, uh, were a <coughs> colonial part of the Swedish Empire and all the crops of the Rhine were uh, grown there were just exported to Sweden. Um, so this is also the reason why uh, the Great Famine uh, was shortly to arrive. Uh, we have the first meadow garden, so we have the first traces that uh, a high culture garden starts to grow in, in the Baltics. Um, of course, we have some kind of gardening already in the Middle Ages, uh, but uh, these were very small and very and um, actually uh, with the sexual limitation, they, uh, we have no traces of those. But also, those first gardens we have uh, produced apples, fruits mainly from the Swedish market. Um, we have other problems too. There were quite severe uh, health problems, and um, um, all of the travel notes we have and all of the, uh, most of the publications we have concerning the Baltic region state that um, both the upper class, the German Baltic German upper classes and the Estonian uh, Lebanon middle and under classes, the peasants, all had severe health problems about the German consumed two months of meat uh, and they got scurvy within one year. Uh, and the same problems uh, appeared with the peasants who uh, had no meat at all, but they uh, ate just their rye and they had the same problem. So uh, severe health problems and gardening was actually the solution to, to solve all these problems and to improve uh, labor and manpower that was badly needed. All this uh, new idea of how we do gardening here had a very bad background. We were quite in the mountain minimum, so we had really very bad weather. It was really cold. Um, and uh, as I said, those uh, three um, big breakdowns were just to appear. Just to make it sure where we are, we are situated here. Here we have uh, Finland and Sweden, here we have Russia. So we are, we are speaking about this little part of the world. Up there is Estonia, down there is Livonia, but those are the Baltic provinces. They belonged in the 17th century to Sweden, the Swedish Empire, and through the, uh, due to the Great Nordic War, they, uh, they became part of Russia. So uh, you can already see uh, how far north we are. Actually, here uh, we have the border where. Uh, gardening, fruit tree gardening, is uh, productive and uh, make uh, economic sense today. But if you think back in the 18th century, with this really hot climate, uh, to start making really productive garden here is quite strange, quite crazy. And uh, there were enormous breakdowns and breakdowns in, 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 in this project. So, but what then is the importance of the book and this garden the books? How to put it together? Firstly, he's a uh, for sure founding father of uh, the modern Baltic gardening narrative. So that gardening is a kind of uh, modernization, modernization project in, in the Baltic. One of the modernization projects that really was successful and uh, helped to make life there more uh, stable and um, um, continue. Um, he is himself a prototype the Baltic gardener as a migrant who had a lot to do with translation, how to translate his knowledge to the local context, to understand what's going on in the local environment. Um, it was very privileged on high positions, God was a very high uh, living standard around him, um, but he had a big promise to really translate his knowledge to the local people. Uh, what we got from his books, when we take the sources, we have fantastic comparative descriptions of what was possible to grow at the end of the 17th century in the Baltics. He's comparing 
the, of the time, what's, what, what, what was possible at that time in Bohemia, what was possible in Germany, and what was not possible, for example, in the Baltics, but what actually culture is quite well there. Um, and we have fantastic description about the techniques used uh, there, greenhouses, all this question of manure, um, but also about this biocultural exchange, so how to do this acclimatization of the new plants arrive, how to make these things grow, and how to make things happen, like we have a very speciality there, we have asparagus ovens to grow asparagus in the Baltics, this is something nobody knows in German, but uh, this was really something uh, that was uh, very, uh, uh, quite well known in the Baltics, and it has to quite well there. Um, and we got even more, we got also information about local practices and all these kind of man-plant relations. Um, we speak a lot about man-animal relations, but we also have man-plant relations, and this is not only about eating, um, but it's also about quite a lot about diseases. So in the 17th century, for example, it's a question of when my apple tree has some uh, disease, who is to blame for that? Of course, it was a gardener who had sex at the wrong time with the wrong lady, and so the apple tree got ill. Uh, so there were quite a lot of reflections of uh, who, who had to play who for what, actually, in, in this man plant relation in, in, in the garden. It's pretty much about the soil, what we can do with a very concrete soil condition, and very much about the winds. Um, uh, in early modern times in the Baltics, it was not about the planet system um, who had major influence on the garden, but it was about the winds. So we had a conflicting local uh, knowledge uh, how to choose the right time for doing what. So local knowledge and uh, high culture knowledge just had to come together to make this gardening thing grow. And Honig was the first Baltic bestseller in Germany. His books really <laughs> were not translated, they were in German, but they were uh, republished in Germany quite a lot of times because he uh, invented a new type of uh, uh, way how to graft uh, fruit trees. But we'll come later to this grafting point later on. Jump, we will jump to the next thing. We jump to the 18th century. The 18th, uh, end of the 18th century, and we will jump to the question of wild food substitutes and uh, we'll speak a little bit about the question of uh, colonialism in the Baltics. Those of you who were here when uh, Cindy Ott gave a presentation might remember uh, that we have this, uh, heard about this wild uh, food thing already in the American context. Um, she was speaking about this uh, Indian, Indian uh, <coughs> Uh, those Indians living there who also have this uh, wild, we use this wild food movement to discover their roots or something like that. And we have great conversations about uh, how to compare what's going on in America with this wild food thing with those what's going on in Europe. Because wild food is extremely important at the moment in the new Nordic cuisine. I don't know if you know something about the new Nordic cuisine, here we have a manifesto. Um, I will not read it, you can just, uh, I will just pass it by. It's, um, it's extremely important at the moment, uh, throughout all Scandinavia, but also in Estonia. And uh, <coughs> they really want to uh, bring together the high levels of cuisine, of cuisine together with the idea of indigenousness, wild thing. It's also a kind of pre-contact thing, it's also about neglecting the German or the uh, the, the German history and to go back to the old Estonian way or old Yugoslavian way how to do food, uh, at least in the Estonian context. So, but um, as a historian who has been, been dealing with quite a big thing with, uh, with the 18th century, I said to Cindy, hi, come on, these are actually the same narratives going on we had already in the time of the Latin. It's nothing new in there, in, in this discourse. So surrogates were a really, really, really high and hot topic in the 18th and 19th century throughout all Northern Europe. It was pretty much um, about going native for the upper classes. Um, and it was about making native the middle and underclasses. So it was a power question too. So, uh, and I, I uh, 
course, later the Estonians and Latvians actually did want to go with this uh, becoming getting native through food, the, the body Germans wanted to make that. Um, it was pretty much about um, the spread of knowledge about white food, what people can eat and uh, what is good to eat. Um, and this knowledge spread over all Northern Europe. So it was nothing really regional or local, it was just common knowledge that spread everywhere. Um, if you want, you can say that this was an early anti-globalization movement. It was, actually, because they said, okay, we don't want this important thing anymore. We want to keep the money in with us and we want to be, <coughs> we want to be local. Um, it was definitely about uh, st uh, stressing um, individual food support. And uh, this actually, here's the point where it, it comes together with the gardening. Also, gardening stresses the individual point. You can do it yourself. You don't depend on this uh, import product or other product. Um, and it was pretty much about uh, a really good knowledge about local uh, environments, where to get what from to eat. So it was for the Baltic Germans, uh, who were migrants for most of the time, it was really something to become <coughs> native, to become local, to know what's going on in their mind. So substitute, I said, that surrogates, as they were called in the 18th centuries, were a high, high topic. Uh, if you speak about just food, you can surrogate and substitute everything if you want, but we're just speaking about food here. Um, they substituted, of course, coffee, tea, different kinds of meat, hot spices, sugar, but also um, gardening products, also cabbage and artichokes, asparagus, all those high class uh, things they started to grow, they were also um, substituted. So uh, the, the white food and the gardening thing actually go hand in hand. And they, uh, we, uh, I like to look. Um, uh, at both of them at one time. So what are the possible colonial implications, actually, in this project, in this wild food discourse? The first thing is very clearly that the border Germans and other classes wanted to teach the local people, the local Estonians and Latvian peasants, uh, what to eat. And they shouldn't eat rye, they shouldn't eat bread, they should go out and gather something that is uh, more cheap for them. Um, no. The Estonians absolutely didn't like it. Uh, this was an idea that uh, didn't go everywhere. So it was uh, this, this idea that the upper class had uh, did not grow at all. The peasants themselves had to forage the wild food for the body Germans. It's not quite sure that the body Germans in most cases, cases didn't go out to, to pick up those berries and things for themselves, but they had the peasants to do that. The slaves, it was, we are speaking about slavery, the, the unfree uh, way of uh, uh, Mela culture we have in Estonia until the beginning of the 19th century. Um, at some point, uh, the body Germans decided to behave themselves also as natives. So in the summer times, sometimes they just wanted to show that aha, also we go out and pick up our berries and pick up our mushrooms. But this was really something to show just the other body Germans we are doing this. This was not for everyday food. Um, here's just a picture of the Berliners from Kappenhausen, the Persian mushrooms in 1906. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. It's just after the revolution and after most of the manor houses were burned down, we have this uh, very clear picture. I, as a Berliners, I go and go native and I will be with you in, in, uh, in doing this uh, wild food thing. Um, actually, behind these, um, there are ongoing. Um, discussions about how to speak about these structures of an inner European colony we have in the Baltic. We have this uh, from the medieval times onwards up to the 20th century, we have the Baltic German upper class. Within the political context it's moving, they are situated in Sweden, in, 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 in Russia whatsoever, but we have a uh, at least a colonial discourse of the uh, German upper classes that is clearly colonial, and we have the structures that are really colonial, at least they are perceived as colonial ones. So what to do with them? Um, uh, yes, I think uh, uh, what I want to stress here is that oh, this kind of going native is just another way of how to express modernity. It's, uh, it's as, as the gardening thing, it's a fundamental structure of how um, the body modernity was constructed in, in a way in the 18th and 19th and also at the beginning of the 20th century. So, but jump to the last example I have for you.
called grafting elation. Grafting is an extremely interesting thing, at least I love it a lot. Um, here you see carnations, and uh, when we go back to our hero of the 17th century, uh, Holig, he was the one who uh, started to engraft all kinds of spices into these flowers to make them smell more nicely. So he uh, started to uh, graft into flowers and carnations, um, 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 cinnamon and other things just to make them uh, more nicer. Uh, with doing that, actually, he was at the forefront of those, uh, uh, in German we say, Nekanisten, uh, those people who were totally obsessed by those flowers in the 18th century. He was doing those things in the 17th century already. It's just about to make the flowers you have, the conditions in this case, uh, uh, to, to create more, more different hybrid types of this, and to make them look more nice, smell more nicer, and just to make a lot of money out. So we should not uh, underestimate this part of the story too. But um, actually this uh, grafting um, flowers is just one part. He got really uh, known for introducing two new kinds of how to make this grafting thing happen. The old techniques we have as the occulation. Here we have a, um, a picture about occulation. We just put a very small part of another plant into a growing tree and uh, here you have a hybrid culture coming out of that. So you have the old rootstock, the wild rootstock, and you put the, the cultivar on it, but mm -hmm. just a very s small part of it. Uh, this, these are some of the old things. He invented two new techniques, and both of these techniques he learned actually from Russia, here being in the eastern part of the world. So he did not invent them, he just translated them to, the, uh, um, to central Germany. And this was a copulation, so we have two parts, the rootstock at the side, and they're both uh, um, the same big. They have the same size and we just put it together. This is copulation. And then you have triangulation. And here you have just a very short part of another one, and a big rootstock, and even this functions. So, and for these two techniques, he got really, really, really very much known all over Europe, and he's known until now. Or, uh, or the man who invented those things or made these techniques popular. Grafting, however, um, had a deep cultural meaning all through the Enlightenment, within the Enlightenment. It was a the cultural metaphor for modernization. I at least uh, want to uh, convince you, I think it was. So, grafting was uh, perceived as part of religion. So, this case really the gardener and the priest were doing the same things. They were just implementing the culture on people or on plants or whatever. They, they, they were those who had to care for the, for the culture. Uh, grafting was part of education, of course. We have a lot of these uh, biologistic metaphors, social and military gardens. We, we know it all, but it was really uh, very, very important in the time of enlightenment. Um, grafting was um, really part of this big uh, biocultural exchange by producing new hybrids through uh, hybridization in, uh, at all, but also through acclimatization, um, um, acclimatization of new plants. So this was really the, the, the hybrid space of the garden was created pretty much uh, as, the, uh, as a big thing in the environmental uh, times. And grafting, of course, was also a med medical necessity. And here, vaccination and, and grafting, actually grafting had the same name. It was the same thing to do. It was just to help people and to make them, uh, 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 yeah, just to help them. And here again, the grafting of a plant is also something to cure the plant, to make it better, to, to, help, to, to, to keep away the diseases the plant might have. Um, of course, grafting also was about big money. Uh, new hybrids uh, just brought enormous money. Uh, so we should not forget that. Um, but in, just to put it together, in the time of enlightenment, or in the end of the enlightenment, grafting was really also a kind of creating new nations. And this is something that is going on just in Eastern Europe. Uh, by bringing them, by bringing Estonians and Latvians new techniques, this new understanding of modernization and culture, uh, Germany just wanted to create new nations. And this actually what happened then with the uh, um, 
uh, establishment of the international states we have by the beginning of the 20th century. So, but well, how the Estonians and Latvians reacted on this program? Uh, looking at the systems, uh, Estonians, we see a big resistance against all this gardening thing the border Germans wanted to implement. Although we have already the first gardening and cookbooks, you know, gardening and uh, cookery uh, went hand in hand, but we were actually the same people who did it. Uh, the gardens were mainly, mostly also the cooks and the manor houses, so those who planted it were responsible. They knew why they do that. There's no reason for it. Uh, extremely intensely covered. Um, so we have the first books written in Estonia and Latin already in the, at the end of the 18th century, uh, but this was meant really only for the new manor houses around the manor houses. Um, we have, though, a big spread of this gardening and cookery thing in Latvia. The Latvians were quite eager to take it over and to uh, implement it into their culture, Latvian culture, but not the Estonians. Um, gardening, I would say, symbolized a transnational, really transnational and quite journalist, uh, Germanized way of life um, that was attracting mostly from social climbers. Um, so here we have really interesting things. At the, you know, we have the national movement at the end of the 19th century in the Baltics. We have really big song festivals. This was the way how to um, um, uh, show your national belonging. Uh, and exactly at the time of the first song festival, we have this first uh, Estonian song festival in 1869, we have also the first gardening exhibition. And while the singers were just uh, uh, producing the national identity, the gardening exhibition was uh, doing it a totally different way. Uh, they um, uh, bear the manor owners mm -hmm. together with the Russian and Estonian gardeners. Uh, produced or showed up their, their new products, the, the biggest pumpkin or something like that. Uh, so it was a real transnational way of uh, how to show it in modern. So on the one hand we have the singers, on the other hand we have the gardeners. And I think this is quite a tricky, tricky thing, uh, an interesting thing at least uh, for the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So only at the end of the uh, 19th century, 1890s, Gardening was integrated as a part, uh, a normal part of the national movement. So Estonians took it over and said, okay, this gardening thing can also be a part of our national identity. But it took a lot of time. I tell that, uh, the Estonians, we know that, they, they loved to eat apples and berries and all those things. But they were eager to steal it or to uh, buy it on the local marketplaces, but would never ever put an apple tree in their house. So this was really a very, very late uh, development we have uh, among the <coughs> Why that? Okay, on the first hand, of course, we have a much harsher climate, although the Baltic uh, uh, provinces are really, you know, we're speaking about 300 kilometers between Tallinn and Riga, but this 300 kilometers have a major impact on, uh, about what kind of weather we have. We have uh, one and a half months more uh, frost, severe frost in winter times in Tallinn than we have in Riga, so every kilometer counts actually. We have a harsher climate in the north. We have also a harsher form of uh, serfdom in Estonia. We have the evolution in 1890. Uh, um, and we have a quite late possession of the land. So after the abolition of serfdom, uh, it took quite a while until the um, Estonian and Livonian uh, peasants could buy their own houses. And only then they started to do this uh, long time gardening thing that's needed at least for food to right? put some carriages in there, but uh, never uh, something that really would take you know, 20 years to, uh, to be productive. There was also a clear lack of manpower. Um, and we also have clear, quite conservative eating habits. Um, and um, quite conservative understanding of what food is. So even by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we have the first questionnaires. Estonians do not perceive berries and mushrooms as food, no. They're just something uh, you can also eat, but it's not food. Food is just uh, bread and something like that. So what is food then? We have uh, different perceptions about what, what it is, what we're talking about. Um, of course, we also have to uh, see that uh, all this doing gardening thing, buying plants uh, and, and, and uh, uh, shoes and so on, it's all expensive. So why, why um, the peasants should put their little money into that. But most of all, I would say, uh, even 
mostly if you compare it with Livonia, where we have uh, quite the same situation, but the Latvians are much more happy to take it over. We have clear cultural views uh, among the Estonians who are very negative and didn't want to, to, to uh, become part of this uh, uh, modernizing culture that all the Germans invented. Uh, and there might be also cultural misunderstandings that the body Germans did not understand that the Estonians had some kind of gardening, but they did it in a totally different way. It was not around the houses, it was somewhere out of the forest. So these are some reasons. Now, I want to present you three possibilities how to bring those three centuries together. Are there any ways how to do it? Yes, I think there are. The first thing is just to look at the actors. So who are the uh, uh, gardeners, who are the cooks, who are the people who are doing that? Who are the institutions, the societies, uh, the manor owners, who are the people? And uh, here we have a, a very clear picture until the end of the 19th century, all the gardening was in the hands really of the Germans, all gardens throughout Russia were Germans. Uh, and only by the end of the 19th century, we have the first Russian, Estonian, Czech gardeners who really uh, put up a new uh, social uh, part of society. Um, and then we can look, if we, if we have these uh, different actors here, we can really look also at private gardens and the private couples of the Estonians and Latvians. And from what time on when actually we have the first traces that they took this over. It's also like a salient about the end of the 19th century. Um, another possibility is to look just at the discourses that are used in propagating gardening. Um, there are many discourses. Uh, we have a lot of pa parallels between uh, how gardening was uh, promoted among Baltic Germans in the 17th century and among Estonians in the 19th century. Actually, they're using the same tricks how to, how to make it popular. So, just one of those um, discourses is dressing of the naked house. Um, here you have a part of the first book about fruit tree gardening written in Estonian. Uh, and you see it's about the um, banishing, rewarding emptiness around the houses. So this is the first thing what they do. They do not speak about that apples are healthy or that you can they make money out of it. No, it's beautiful. If you have a house, it's just beautiful to have a garden, a garden around and to have an apple tree. And actually, this is exactly the same uh, we have already in the 18th century um, when uh, people were really, really, really pushing gardening among the manor houses. Uh, even there it was said, if you have a manor house and you have no garden, it's just a naked house. It's not beautiful. You have to make the, the culture of your manor house an integrate part of the nature around. And for this you need the set of having a garden. So actually, uh, the Estonians were using the same kind of uh, how to implement the garden as a thing as the modern Germans had already. And it was not economic, it was mostly the first part of its beauty. Uh, but there are many very parallel uh, discourses about how to promote this thing, and how to promote eating, and uh, how to think about health and all those things. We have it, it's a, a truly literary thing. Uh, going at the same time on in German writings and Latin writings and in Estonian writings, so it's a, it's a parallel thing. Um, and then we have the question about this land plant relations. Uh, we did speak about this a bit before. It's a question about where are where are the diseases coming from in food trees. Um, in the 17th century, it was clear for holding it is a, uh, it's a moral problem. It's pretty much a gender problem too. In the 19th century, this thing is changing into a very interesting way. Here is the question uh, if science changes the rootstock permanently. So if you put a cultivar on this rootstock, that this might have a permanent influence on wild culture uh, beyond. Or is it possible that the rootstock can overpower at some point in history uh, the cultivar you put on? So uh, how are the power relations between the two, the two parts you have there? Um, and so that's actually the question of this new hybrid you're producing or the cure of the next generation of how long you can you have a pure culture. And this of course, this of course was a thing that was really, really important in the context of the national uh, 
uh, movement we have in the end of the 19th century. Here, gardening really is just a metaphor for what's going on in society. You have the German culture uh, put on the Russian culture put on the Estonian rootstock, and what happened there actually? So here, it, through gardening, just people just expressed their own national feelings and concerns they had. Um, it's there we have really colonial feelings about losing one's identity, uh, and on both parts, the Baltic Germans had a lot of feelings about that, uh, but also the Estonians. Um, and so we have a really strange development of this uh, pure national apple syndrome. So really <laughs> the, the, the need to develop something that is really pure just Estonian or really pure just German. And this is something that really goes on in the border now. This goes on in the border German part of Russia and in, in those, uh, not in the, the central part of Germany. They, this discourse is absolutely unnecessary, but this is a discourse of the, uh, of the um, the uh, parts around. And of course, um, later on, this, uh, this helped also to develop the Soviet utopias of hybridization, but I will not go on in deeper into that. So, to make hybrid, these hybrid identities, the, the hybrid themselves, the thing that people wanted to have. But this is another discourse of the 20th century, and I'm not going into that. So, instead, some conclusions. Why at all we need such a story? Actually, this is a question you have to answer me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm offering you some uh, possibility how to answer this in a nice way. <laughs> so, for me at least, I think uh, it is necessary just because we have here, looking into the gardening history, um, one of the very few non national narratives of modernity. In, uh, in the bodies. Actually, modernity is all the time just a, 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 a connection with the national movement, and here we have something that is definitely not national, or not, not only national. It's quite colonial, transnational whatsoever, but it's not only national. Um, it helps definitely to reconceptualize Baltic history in a broader frame. Just to say that Baltic history, what do we have? Our local potatoes and tomatoes, they are part of the bigger global world. And this already is something really badly needs in Baltic history, just to put it in a bigger context. Um, it makes the long 18th century, here I'm speaking as a literary society, um, the 18th century that is perceived as the century of the worst slavery um, into the context of modernity. So even this 18th century that is perceived as such a bad time is actually already part of this uh, modernizing project we have. Uh, and it is integrated even the, the time before the sleep break we have, but because here the first volume of starts. And actually until now in literature science, uh, 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 among my colleagues from literature science, uh, nobody has looked at those books because they're totally not in the context of the Baroque time, and they're totally not in the context of the Enlightenment time because this was later, a century, a good centuries later. So what to do with those books? Here, I say, here yeah, it's the same narrative. They belong to this modernization narrative. Um, it's important to have such a story to questioning um, the really, really ongoing concept of clashing food cultures in the, in the Baltic. So we have. Um, a very conservative Estonian food culture that has absolutely nothing in common and is absolutely pre-modern and uh, uh, modernized only in the 20th century immediately, but there is no modernization process before that. So if we are looking into those things, we have, of course we have those actors. We have Estonian actors, we have the Estonian books, we have the Estonian everywhere in this uh, modernization process, even in um, times uh, quite long before the 20th century. Um, speaking as a literature scientist, it brings back old books into history. This is something in the Soviet nobody loves to have. We don't deal with old books because they are <laughs> not part of history. Uh, sources of history are just a high level sources, but not written ones. So this is my my personal program, just to say, okay, these are really good sources too. We have to deal with them. Um, but it also helps to promote environmental issues in body history, I find in a quite nice way because actually this thing, the, history, the story of gardening is answering a big question 
how the society came out with the break, how, how, what they learned from that, or what strategies, strategies they developed to uh, not to make happen something like that again that we had at the end of the 17th century. So here we really have the question of resilience, how, to, how the society learned from that, and gardening really was the key solution for that, uh, that helped the society also through all the breakdowns of the 20th century in a quite nicely way. So really here is, uh, we have we have a good way of, uh, a good story, a good modern story actually to tell. And it's extremely popular. So if, uh, here I'm speaking just as uh, a, a woman who has to promote environmental history in the, in the Baltics. This story, everybody understands. It's very simple, but it can, it can also be very uh, complicated. But it's in first drop, it's simple. People understand it quite good. It's, it's, it's considered food, it's uh, uh, through food, you are connected with the environment. This the story itself is very simple and it's attractive for all kinds of museums. It's attractive for the National Museum, the Art Museum, the Ethnographic Museums, Manor House Museums. So they all want to have this story. They all want to be part of that and to put them into this big story. It's attractive for schools. Really, teachers love to have a story to tell their children because it's attractive and it's a simple story. Um, and it's popular also for the high cuisine chefs who want to make something out of that. Uh, and for all kinds of local project groups. So this is really something, if you're speaking about whom are we writing our books for, this is a story that is good for academia, okay, not brilliant, not to pay, but it works also, <laughs> but it works also for the local people. And this is, uh, I guess, this is, this is a nice story there. And just to make it clear, there's, there are different projects behind that, actually all the things I named here, are running projects we have in our center, uh, but there's also another book project about 101 Estonian food stuff. It's just a put, you know, whatsoever into a bigger um, historical framework to say that automatically we have the history and we are going to tell this history. Um, and this is a very popular series and it's a widely popular book. So much about my conclusions. I'm hoping for your suggestions just to make it clear again how attractive and utopian actually vegetable can be. I, uh, I had to put, I had to give you this picture too about Mjellin as a vegetable city in, uh, uh, after 100 years and I really think that beyond uh, vegetable, if you look into comic books or whatsoever, uh, they're, they're doing a lot about this vegetable thing. So vegetable environment has a utopian uh, power that we already saw. I hope you saw it too in the time of the Thank you.